We have a lot of questions. I mean, we might not get to all of them. Um, <laughs> We're from Paris. So, no, no, it's great. Um, here's another, here's a question. So, this, this is a question, how do, how does sound and vision intersect in your poems? Meaning, the sound of the poem, how it's spoken. I'm thinking of Olson's projective verse idea of, of the line being a breath. Um, but then also the visual object of, of the poem on the page. And I know it's another very, very large question, but um, if you could talk something about that for you or for just poetry in general, how these two things might intersect for you. Um, you know, there, there's, there's a relationship between, uh, I think in, in poetry there's this inherent relationship between the line and a sense of, of uh, between the visual line on the page and a, as a manifestation or an enactment of a kind of musical phrase, right? Mm -hmm. And and that there is that that link between that inherent link between music and language. That as soon as we start speaking, we in a sense we're we're singing, mm -hmm. you know. And as soon as people started vocalizing, they began to kind of sing. And and there is this. Um, when you begin to put the language on the page, you're beginning to compose, you're composing a musical line in some way, in some very important way. Um, you know, I, I, I think that, that for me, um, it, it's, it's more about the, the sound of the language, and once it's getting on the page, that's, it, it's just that sound is suddenly manifesting itself on the paper. It, you know what I'm, I don't know if I'm yeah. being terribly articulate, but it's, um, and that, that that is dictating the length of the line, mm -hmm. and then some other sense of some other compulsion comes into play where then I want to create a sort of visual pattern that I'm looking at, and that's going to influence how I begin to compose other lines yeah. and how I begin to sort of mm -hmm. interpret and think about them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I think that the visual and, you know, visual line spacing, whatever, I mean, for me, is just another form of punctuation. I mean, you would use it the same way that you would use a comma to say, you should take more space here, or here begins a separate thought. Uh, the sound thing is a little, uh, you know, is you know, is very complicated. I mean, it would be like asking a painter, you know, how do you deal with color or hue as opposed to form? You know, it's sort of, it's sort of what you're working with, the, the sound. And, you know, so there will be some points where you're doing a little line, but there will be other things where like the sound is really the structural bones of the poem. And you'll be like, okay, I, you know, I remember this very short poem I wrote where I was like, I need to start with a, like a strong O sound in the first stressed syllable, and then I need the last stressed syllable to also be a strong O sound. So you get this sense of diagonal across the poem, and that is stitching the poem. I mean, it's whole, it's the kind of eye beam that's holding the whole thing together. Yeah. You know? That's great. I don't, I'm, I'm not at all equipped to answer this question because I have very little visual imagination. If I, if somebody ever mentions that there's an image in a poem I've written that they like, I can't remember what the image might actually be. Like really? There was, there was an image in there? So I'm, I'm a sound hound mm -hmm. for me, right? Almost everything comes down uh, to sound or, you know, vibration, which is all really. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but I, I think, um, I think that there are, at the level of syntax, there are certain arrangements of sound that declare necessary shapes. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, you know, for, for someone as devoted to sound as I am, I might as well, for all intents and purposes, be writing Anglo Saxon alliterative verse. Yeah. And then even in Anglo Saxon alliterative verse, there is, an, uh, there is uh, a space carved out of each line that goes just to what you were mentioning. Well, a pause must occur here. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it has something to do with, uh, with the speed at which the eye and the ear and the mind can consume language. Can, can, I had this revelation about Anglo-Saxon alliterative verse actually this, this year. So it, it was, um, I, I, I traveled to the Faroe Islands um, I, this uh, past September. Uh, I, think, I think the actual accomplishment is I got funding to travel yeah, to the Faroe Islands. I did. I did. And, um, and it actually had to do with Anglo-Saxon literature first, but um, that uh, the, the Faroe Islands are a, um, 
they're sort of north of Scotland and kind of equidistant between Iceland and Norway. So they, it's about 17 islands that sit off there. The people speak a version of essentially kind of Old Norse still. It's most closely related to kind of in between Norwegian and contemporary Norwegian and Icelandic. It's something in between there. And they, uh, the people there perform uh, something called the circle dance where uh, large numbers of people, they, they get together during festivals and weekends and things, they hold hands and they sing. There's a leader who sings uh, these very ancient medieval poems uh, and then there, there's a sort of call, and then everyone sings uh, the, you know, the, the, the accompanying verse. And there's a very simple dance step that people, where it's sort of two steps forward and one step back, and they keep kind of progressing in the circle as they go. And when I heard it, of course, I, I don't speak or understand Faroese, but as I was hearing it and listening to it, I understood that it was this alliterative structure with the caesura in the middle. And I thought, this is, they're actually performing Anglo-Saxon verse. And when I went there, I met with a group of Faroese poets and talked to them about it. And they said, well, yes, these are these ancient ballads that have been sung. There was one about, uh, you know, that they sing after killing pilot whales. There's one that they sing after uh, the, the uh, you know, fall sheep slaughter. There are these, these different things. And it was, I had always thought of that verse form as this thing from antiquity that was dead. It was an antique. And there are these 17 like islands place. in the North Atlantic <laughs> yeah. where people, it's still being enacted as it once was in the mead halls, you know. <laughs> and, and here it was. It's alive. It's been perpetuated. People in the 19th century were still writing these verses. And they go on for hours. <laughs> hours. And, and it, was, it was actually tremendously moving and beautiful to see something that I thought was dead actually being performed and and uh, and carried on. Great. Um, okay, this is a totally different kind of question. What was the first poem you ever wrote and what were the circumstances? <laughs> just to let you know, just to let you know, Clayton Eshelman's answer was that he was two. <laughs> and he recited the poem that he wrote when he was two. So I'm just letting you know that it, it doesn't have to be a really amazing poem. It could be like. I think Clayton wrote my first poem. <laughs> I wrote a poem about a waterfall that I actually remember, but um, and it rhymed. Um, but uh, I'm really embarrassed by it. So I think I was in second grade. Yeah. I don't want to remember. <laughs> yeah, I, my my sister was the one who wrote poetry in the family while I was off writing these very strange short INSCO-like plays <laughs> uh, that I would perform in the junior high school cafeteria <laughs> to an audience of bewildered and dangerous students. <laughs> I'm going to exempt myself from this question simply to say that I am not entirely convinced that I've written a poem yet. <laughs> as a child at all, so it was much, much later. Um, probably in college, I think, when I took a um, creative writing class, and I'm sure, I, 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 I know I didn't write any poem before that. I didn't know that that was even a possibility. The idea that that's something you could just do or was in any way desirable was completely foreign to my uh, uh, idea of myself or what what one could do. The, I, I thought all poets were dead. You know, I didn't know that there were living poets. I didn't understand that at all. I didn't understand that there was that, that poetry was still written and that it, there was a there was a kind of contemporary world of it. And when I did discover that, it was as though I had found, you know one of the lost tribes wandering around somewhere, you know, I'm like, what? <laughs> do this? I, you know, it was really, so it, it just, 
yeah, it didn't occur to me until much later. It's a very magical feeling when you are having it, but when you are the evidence of it and you have to explain it to someone else. <laughs> I can remember the very first time someone asked me what it was I did, and I explained it, and they burst out laughing. <laughs> they thought that I was making a joke. As, as if they were like, well, those, those people aren't alive anymore, are they? <laughs> Depending on your depending on your definition of a lie. Yes, I'm a, I'm a barber so. surgeon. Yes. I'm a flood surgeon. <laughs> okay. Um, I have a kind of specific question for this group, which is um, all of you guys um, from your reading last night and your current work. Are responding to translating, transliterating, using, uh, borrowing um, other f forms or things that are that exist already, like the superheroes, Ignaps, um, the Heaven Letters. Could you talk about that? I mean, because I think a lot of times people think, especially when they're first starting writing poetry, well, I'm just going to sit in my room and write about my thoughts. And so, how does... <laughs> how does <laughs> if only one had thoughts. Yeah. <laughs> so, how, you know, let's just... I wanted to talk about... We were talking on the radio a little bit about that overlay. I think we used that word of, of <clears throat> using something else. And, you know, like, Mark, you take these, these prayers and then sort of redo them. But... Um, talk about that a little bit. That, I mean, is it a collaboration? Oh, how do you think of it? Oh, I don't think of it as a collaboration. I think uh, more like a violation. But um, <laughs> I, you know, the reason I wrote this book about the Ignatz poems, which was sort of a, uh, which was sort of new for me, was because I was very attracted to sort of the idea of character and the sort of a narrative texture. You know, there's a way in which narrative is written that has a texture that's kind of missing from a lot of lyric. Uh, but I just really was not interested in writing narrative poetry. Like I just. Like, I remember this one instance comes to mind. Like, I was trying to write this poem about, like, Sir Walter Raleigh's travels in, like, uh, in Guinea and his search for El Dorado and all of this. And, you know, and what I was really trying to get to was this one moment at the very end where this person is kind of, this hideously burned man is drifting down the Orinoco River, having been cast out of the city. Um, but the, to get there, you had to just go through all of this, like, you know, and then there's Sir Walter Raleigh, and then, you know, and then he's on a boat, and, you know, and he's looking for this city and you know and I'm just like I don't this want is awesome. <laughs> yeah. and, um, you know and I'm just like I just don't want to go through all of that um, I just don't want to you know I'm interested in this one very small contour at the very end of the story I don't want to have to go through all of that to get there and I feel like you know back when for example Keats wrote in Dimion he didn't have to be like okay there's this goddess and she lives in the sky and then there's this you know <laughs> sleepy guy and you know like I mean you know he's just able, kind of with light handedness, to just kind of riff on that pre existing story. And so, I, what I wanted to do was sort of a a series of riffs that enable a sort of light handedness, uh, lightness of touch, uh, with that, you know, you're still able to do character. Uh, and you're still able to kind of have these small contours of story, but it's not like a continuous narrative. And you know, one of the things I enjoyed doing was just kind of dropping in things that seemed like scenes from a movie that is never explained. Um, yeah. uh, you know, I was I, I found myself drawn to these uh, this kind of reinterpretation of. Of these these prayers and and um, kind of mystical letters and things, because as a way of, of um, you know as a way of kind of getting getting around yourself, you know that that one of the things that that um, another source using another source as a as a as a kind of backstop for your for your poems um, is that you know you can. There's some sort of template there. There's some sort of pattern that you can begin to respond to and interpret and and shape, um, so that it isn't all about your own feelings and thoughts, and as as if those were were particularly fascinating. You know, m my own thoughts and feelings are not fascinating. They're the same as pretty much everyone else's, and. 
and um, and therefore, you know, just not not something I would expect people care about or care to read. I mean, my friends care about it, and that's what they're for. But it's you know, it's that's not the job of literature. Um, I I was also very interested in the, the sources I was looking at. Um, I was interested in their specificity. That that these 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 sources of prayers and things. The, the idea behind them is that it's language is enacting something in the world. Language is aimed at changing something. A prayer, you know, a prayer during a time of of drought is is aimed at bringing rain. You know, I mean, it has. There's something that that you, you want it to do, and I was really interested in that. Uh, in, in that sense of language, in language that 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 the, the the repetition of it, the thinking of it, the saying of it, could actually change something in the world and bring and make something happen, and so I was really drawn to those. But I'm also estranged from those original texts in several ways. They're 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 very old. You know, they're from another century. They're from a, another kind of religious belief that I don't necessarily share. They, um, they're written in a Gothic script. They're written in another language that I do read, but an antiquated version of it. So there are these many different things that are estranging me from that original text, which gives me permission to begin to interpret it and shape it as I bring it forward into the context of this time and space and language and my own perception. And, and that, for me, it was, it was both enough of a shape and, and distant enough from me that I, I felt like I could make a poem from it. Mm -hmm. So, I want to add your way would be, a, um, well, Mark's would be a kind of triangulation of self, and, and yours is a shorthand, um, which, I mean, I mean, using other sources. Mm -hmm. And would, would yours be entering into a, a sort of pre existing world? And, uh, but there, there are two ways to answer this question. The first is correspond to this actual project, and there are many things I can say about why I was drawn to that actual work. Primarily, I'm interested in it because, as a form, it was non-deliberative and non-literary. Yeah. Right? It, it merely occurred. It was made by a collaboration. Uh, it was designed for commercial purposes uh, and presumed to never really have uh, a highly thoughtful audience. A bright audience, and you know, an interested audience, um, but not an exegetically inclined audience. <laughs> and I think that I think that things can occur when that deliberation withdraws um, that are harder uh, to find when that deliberation is present. Um, but the the general answer to that question, you know, why go to something else? I have very very little interest in like my squamous emotional energy. <laughs> I, uh, I'm, I'm the kind. I'm the kind of person who needs an interlocutor. If I'm going to think, I need something to think about. I need someone to have a conversation with. Mm -hmm. In the absence of those things, I'm just <laughs> kind of inert. Uh, and so, and so, I, I need that in order, honestly, to activate my intelligence or even my capacity for emotional engagement. Uh, and I, I also think that. I don't know. I mean, I, I, uh, I'm a really big believer in constraint and the value of constraint. Mm -hmm. So on yeah. the rare occasions when I teach a creative writing workshop, no one believes that I actually do this, but the first directions I give, like, okay, in this, uh, in this poetry class, you are not allowed to write about anything you have felt, thought, or experienced. <laughs> uh, and, 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 and of course, I just get this befuddlement, like, well, what thing did you possibly write about? No, no, I've just gotten rid of 90% of your capacity to generate crap, right? Uh, now make something else. And the things that come out of people, right, when you deny them the opportunity for explicit self-expression, tell you so much more about those people, what they love, how they love, what they think, what they value, yeah. what they hear. Right? Um, so you know, I understand that there are, there are limits to it, and there's plenty of, uh, of poetry in which 
the poet does speak to their own feelings in a more emotionally explicit way. This is very moving to me. Mm-hmm. I'm just never going to make that poetry. Yeah. No, it's kind of like in, I mean, I n- never understood why the craft of poetry should be cons- considered so much more internal than all other art forms. Like if you're starting painting or drawing, then you draw a circle, a, you know, pyramid, a square. And, uh, you know, in a, in poetry, like often it's kind of like write about your childhood, you know, and you're just like, that's not the thing to start out with. And so I do something similar to Ray, which is I say, okay, first class, you're not going to write a word. You're going to take other people's words and rearrange them into patterns because that's one thing that a poet should know how to do is to rearrange words. And then you're going to take other people's forms and you're going to take other people's stories. And, you know, you're going to work on that before you wor- worry about your own forms and your own stories. Great. Um, can you talk about a moment of frustration, um, a time when you experienced, <laughs> or times <laughs> when you experienced a failure of language? Yeah. Can, can we answer that with a moment when we did it? Well, it's right now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I mean, you're always it, you're always pushing against the the limitations of language every time you try try to write a poem. You yeah. know, I mean, it's it's. I, I I always tell my students, I want your ambition for the poem to exceed your ability. Mm-hmm. You know, I I want because in that space between the thing you're trying to achieve and what you know how to do, it's it's, there's you're, you have to leap upward in order to kind of get to something else, and and so it's it's about kind of what you don't know and understand. That's where the interesting thing begins to happen. What you don't know and understand about language is where you end up finding a surprise, and and that's stimulating, and that's what we want want to read. Um, I, you know, I've spent much more of my life not writing than I have write, spent writing, and I have, go through long periods of time where I don't write poems at all. And and you know, there are all of those um, kind of horrible proclamations of you know a real writer writes, and you write every day, and it's about maintaining a practice and doing all of this stuff. Well, that's that's not how I work. I've never worked that way, and and I've stopped trying to to do it that way. Mm-hmm.
they will never know a world where they can't kind of curate everything all the time, where they don't have access to, you know, all, all the films they want online and to images and to music that you can constantly kind of choose for yourself all of these sorts of things that you 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 can rarefy and refine what it is you like to such a degree that I, I worry about people finding things kind of accidentally and 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 or being limited in some ways and having to kind of create things themselves. That that worries me more, I think. But I, don't, I think poetry is in no danger whatsoever. I I do sort of wish that maybe when when. I'll get asked questions about, say, the future of publishing, maybe more than of poetry itself. And I, I do feel like the relative ease of production and reproduction now uh, is creating a bit of an impulse uh, to simultaneously restore the materiality and the ephemerality of, of the exchange of poems. And, uh, so I know more and more people who want to print letterpress or handwrite their own poems and then have very limited uh, and, and to, to control the terms of exchange. Mm -hmm. and, uh, these are poems I'm going to hand make as it were and only a few people will see them. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so you know so the, the, the restoration of a kind of intimacy of exchange as opposed to the total totally impersonal ubiquitous, uh, nature of digital reproduction, um, but I, I think for I think for every you know uh, every swing of the pendulum, you will inevitably have you know the reverse course. Yeah. And I tend to I tend to think a little bit about the specialization of genre. Um, like you think about the function that uh, that dramas, uh, the plays performed, uh, you know, 500 years ago or a thousand years ago. And they performed a lot more functions than they do today now that you have movies and, you know, the television, you know, and the news and written books and, you know, all of these things. So they no longer have to convey this, like, all entertaining function. They no longer have to uh, put this, you know, move it, you know, perpetuation of knowledge function, etc. And poetry may be the same thing, um, you know, because it no longer has to do a certain function that it used to perform, and some people mourn that, and I don't tend to, actually. Like, I tend to think that, you know, plays are more, you know, obviously they're going to have a smaller audience than when they were performing all functions to all people, but they're, they're more interesting once certain, you know, like painting became, I think, more interesting once photography was in, uh, was uh, painting, drawing maybe may have become more interesting as a function of specialization of genre. Once photography allowed for the sort of capturing of an image and the conveying of an image and the information in that image to become much more easy, then painting was freer to be about itself. And you know, poetry, I think, at this point, is fairly free to be about itself, and I kind of like that. And we, I think, we also have this kind of capacity for rosy retrospection, right? Mm -hmm. People talk about the novel as foundational to our modern sense of self, and this yeah. is the the literary norm. Yeah. When it, you know, when Clarissa, for instance, mm -hmm. um, uh, was in fact the equivalent of people looking at that device. Yeah. Like, what are you doing distracting yeah, right. yourself with something so freakish because yeah. you suddenly have free time? Mm -hmm. right? And very quickly, that thing went from being a bizarre, freakish niche phenomenon yeah. to, oh, well, this is the ins this is the essential unit of literary inheritance for our culture. Yeah, or Dickens and Trollope were the equivalent right. of, like, you know, Jersey Shore. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, this ties, kind of ties into the last question. Um, so like I said last night, One Pause Poetry is named after Ikkyu Sojun, who is a 15th century Japanese uh, Zen master and poet. And at that time, and, and again, this is actually not, one was not considered uh, human if they did not write, read, or have knowledge of poetry. Um, there d definitely were people who, who didn't read and write. But um, I was wondering what, just thoughts on what we could do now to make this more the case in America. It's kind of going against what you were arguing, the opposite of your argument. So you could say you don't want it to be the case just to have more people know more about poetry, um, read poetry, understand poetry. Is that something that you want? 
And if so, how would we do that? I think you have to clear out what is taking up too much space. Right? The, the thing that's dangerous about the idea that you are not fully human if you do not read or write poetry is that it suggests the possibility of a kind of cultural class hierarchy mm -hmm. right? uh, in, which, in which literacy uh, is, is privileged at the expense of a uh, kind of egalitarianism. Uh, and this, for, for me, if you want people to pay more attention to poetry, to care more about it, you have to address things that don't explicitly concern poetry at all. Like I, I think that I think that our uh, our society is poisoned by wealth. Right. Uh, I think uh, I think we are obsessed with the signification of what we are able uh, to purchase and hold as opposed to what we can imagine and experience. Um, but I don't feel like just pointing to the things that we can imagine and experience and saying, these are good, value these things, is ever going to be enough. Right? You have to somehow pierce or compromise or erode the devotion we have to other forms of meaning. You have to get that out of the way. And once that is out of the way, I think things like poetry will fill that vacuum. Yeah, I think if you if you detach the kind of concerns of economics, education, you know, the the sort of people's access to literacy, um, it, it, and and can kind of set that off to the to the side for a second, I think, um, you know, I, I I think things like poets in the schools programs and things like that are all, all have very noble intentions and are probably really good. You know, I think it's it's great for people to have access um, to to uh, programs and things like that. But I, I think um, I, I don't think that there is. You know, I, I think the culture of poetry in the United States is alive and well in many ways. I think its significance in the larger culture is, you know, it doesn't have that much of a significance in the larger culture. Although, you know, just yesterday I walked through the English department at the University of Michigan, and here you have a large state university with a, a large English department. A good portion of the money and time and, and thought that goes on there is devoted to literature and is devoted to poetry. And I think preserving kind of repositories where these places, you know, where, where, where literature and poetry can be fostered and written and preserved and appreciated is about as much as anyone can do. I think things like this, places like this, places like the University of Arizona Poetry Center, you go there and it's like a temple in the desert to poetry. They built this multi-million dollar uh, uh, building. It's gorgeous. They have one of the largest collections of poetry in the United States. States, and uh, they have terrific programs, and it's just there. It's it just exists, and it's a it can be found and appreciated and gone to. And I think having those places where that can happen is is tremendously important. Well, I think it's I think it's important, but I think it shouldn't be exclusive. Like I don't work with poets. I don't you know I work with lawyers. I uh, and I think a lot of people who you know are you know a lot of people who would be interested in poetry are kind of intimidated by going to the bookstore and seeing the rack of slim volumes of verse, none of which you know they can distinguish from the others um, and you know there are any number of people who have you know who are not poets who have asked me, take me through the poetry section of a bookstore and explain things to me. I really want to know about this and then you also think about things like poems on the underground where you know you really do see every kind of commuter just kind of staring at the poem on the billboard and thinking about 
about it, mm. really kind of enjoying it. I mean, certainly more than the usual things that are on the subways. And I don't know why we can't have, without dumbing it down, like I think that one of the tragic things about like, you know, poetry in motion in this country is they started putting snippets or like little bits of songs rather than actual poems, which is what they, for example, will put up in London. But, um, you know, just like, we're not stupid. Don't dumb it down. Just put a poem up there, see what people do with it. In the same way that public art is put up uh, all over the place in airports and, you know, you know, people have gotten, you know, people have gotten used to a very sophisticated level of visual art. There's no reason they should not be able to understand a very sophisticated level of, uh, of poetry. It's just they want some access to it and it shouldn't be locked in, you know, in these volumes. It shouldn't be locked in the universities. It should just be out there. I mean, people like it more than you think they do. Mm -hmm. You know, if you want to do something truly revolutionary in this environment, just give something away. Yeah, just ru yeah, put it up on a billboard on the freeway. I mean, people will, I mean, well, maybe not because you don't really want people reading long things on billboards while they're driving, but like, you know, but just, you know, put in the bus, you know, put ads up on the bus stops. They actually you know? did put them in bull billboards in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. uh, particularly at intersections where people often sat in traffic. Yeah. And they, they were wonderful. It was really well, great. Loved it. And um, uh, they were completely anonymous. Someone donated the money for it. No one, I'm sure people, some people know who did. Mm -hmm. They, you know, they chose short poems that were quite excellent and they put them up just a white background, black letters, up on big billboards, mm -hmm. like next to, That's great. you know. And where there's worse traffic, you can just print all of A. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I had a question about how that relates to other um, cultures a little bit. I've heard about, um, you know, read article, I think it was by Kim Rosen about. Um, how in other, you know, other countries, other other languages, sort of poets are heroes mm -hmm. and are national yeah. heroes, and cab drivers write poems, yeah. and people are, you know, where poetry is much more part of daily life than it is here. And I just sort of wonder. I mean, you've touched on some of it, the or crass, you know, our materialism, but about what what it is about Americans. I mean, I, I'm so provincial. I, <laughs> I'm very provincial, so I'm just curious if maybe you have any thoughts on that. It is about Americans. Why we, why it isn't more? Is it just materialism more? Well, I think part of it is because it's not made available. I mean, like, there's this sense of preciousness to poetry. I mean, you know, like, I hate the word poetic when it's, you know, when it's not applied to poetry because what it usually means is, like, overly purple or kind of princessy, and you're just like, oh, <laughs> you know, like, why talk about poetic prose? Like, talk about good prose, bad prose, you know, um, but this whole, like, poetic notion is just so inherently elitist that it, it really bothers me. Um, I think, you know, it's, it, it's, um, I, I, I spent some time in Iceland recently too, and, and you know the poets in, in Iceland. That poetry is is the very basis of the preservation of their culture. It's it's at the at the very core, and the sagas, the Icelandic sagas, are are their national history. And you go to the culture house to see the manuscripts, most of which were taken from Iceland. This it's very interesting when the when it was a um, uh, when, when the, it was kind of a Danish colony for a while, and, and in the uh, one of the first things the Danes did is round up all of the copies of the famous books that they could find and take them to Copenhagen, to take them off the island and to put them in the libraries in Copenhagen, because they understood the relationship and the importance of this history and of these books and of this literature to the cultural identity of these, these people who they kind of wanted to colonize. So they removed their history and they put it there. And one of the sad things is that the, 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 the building where many of these books were kept in Copenhagen burned. Uh -huh. So um, a lot of them were lost. But one of the national heroes of Iceland is a man, an Icelander, who when he saw this library on fire in Copenhagen ran, knew where the books, where the Icelandic books were kept and ran in <laughs> to the fire and, and brought out the books. And as many of them as he could, thus preserving these some of the most important literary works in the world. And uh, you know, and he's considered a, nation, a national hero. Um, and the books have been returned to Iceland and you go to this rather small building to see them. Uh, and you can view these objects, which are 
are the history of a country. They are wrapped up in verse. And, and you know, wandering around Reykjavik, there's a, a sign on a house, a blue plaque, you know, signifying that an important person lived there. And I was reading it, there, and, and uh, it's in Icelandic, and then they have an English version of it. And it turned out that it was the person uh, who translated Milton into Icelandic once lived in this house. You know, I mean, it's sort of like that many stuff true, but they consider that to be an important person in Iceland. So it's kind of, you know, it's a, it, there too, the other thing that strikes you about that country is how materially poor it is that, that it has been for centuries. They just did not have a lot of objects in their life. They, their, their world is not stuffed with things, um, and and instead they have this other thing. So I, I really don't. There's you know there's a strong anti-intellectual strain in America that you're constantly fighting against. There's a suspicion of of literature, and and I, and I, but I also think that that runs counter to um, people's actual desire to experience it and have access to it, and and you know. Um, so. I don't. Yeah, I, I don't think that we are actually very successfully democratic. But I think that when you have an entire nation that defines itself relative to an idea of escape, that does something to the the corresponding idea of cultural consistency or memory. Right? We don't stay where we grew up, even within this country. You know, we uh, we derive a lot of meaning from the. From however we conceive those populations as other, uh, even if we have an anxious relationship to those populations, in the same way that the English language itself, when you're trying to teach English to a non, uh, uh, to, to someone for whom English is not their first language, they will immediately note how indiscriminately sticky and stupid the language is. <laughs> right? Um, uh, it's, vo it's vocabulary base, it's noun base, is whorish. And they go, oh, uh, we like the sound of that, we don't have a concept for that, um, <laughs> we're just gonna take it in and we'll mispronounce your version of it. <laughs> um, as opposed to, say for instance, always trying to, uh, to use, you know, to, to, to introduce new terms into the language in a way that respects the history and integrity of that language. There are advantages to that. One of the advantages is this tremendous uh, Catholicity and fecundity and variety. But what you're not going to get is consistency right, uh, or a strong through line or clear narrative. Um, so I think in some ways it's inevitable. Um, yeah, you know, I, I agree with the strain of anti-intellectualism, but I also think there's something about English and about the United States itself that, uh, that runs contrary to the kind of community that is capable of valuing poetry as expressive of a culture's whole properties or essence. I think um, we have to stop now, but thank you uh, so much for this conversation, and um, thank you for coming and being in the audience and listening. Uh, come back to our other programs. We'll have another poetry reading on June 17th with Keith Taylor and Laura Kosciuszki. Um There's some books for sale, and I think the poets uh, might sign some if you buy them. So thank you. <laughs>